Welcome to Opto Sessions, where we interview the brightest minds from the stock market, uncovering their secrets to success. If you're looking for ideas, tips and techniques from the world's best, you're in the right place. Welcome listeners to Opto Sessions. I'm Ed Gotham and in this interview we're talking to William Hobbs, CIO at Barclays Wealth and Investments, about the current state of affairs in markets along with a deep dive on investment strategy. We'll go into detail on how Will uses a market sentiment indicator to go risk on or off, the dynamics behind how the financial markets try and endlessly predict the future, and even the top indicators to watch to guide your decision making in the current downturn. Hello everyone. Today we have the great pleasure of talking to one of my favourite Opto contributors, William Hobbs. Will has over 20 years experience in the financial sector and currently has the prominent position of Chief Investment Officer for Barclays Wealth and Investments. Good morning, Will. Great to have you on the show. How has the uh, transition to work from home been going for you? Uh, it's not been without challenges, I'm not going to lie, Ed. Um, it's been pretty busy. Um, so my wife has actually had, um, uh, well, we're pretty sure she's had um, the coronavirus, the latest coronavirus. Um, and certainly she experienced the more kind of more experience, a severe end of the uh, sort of range of symptoms. Uh, but she is on the mend now, thankfully. But we have two uh, young children who are much more likely to pay attention to uh, the words of Darth Vader than they are to listen to a word I say. So homeschooling has been challenging. Uh, and obviously uh, the job has been um, pretty busy given what's going on in the world at the moment. Yeah, no, of course. I'm um, sorry to hear that about your wife. Um, well, luckily she's on the mend, so... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's, that's great news. Um, I think it would be great to start, um, if you could tell us a little about, about your story and how you got to where you are today. From memory, it was, it's been quite an interesting, unique start. <laughs> yeah, that's the one word for it. Well, I, I didn't I have to say, I wasn't born wanting to be um, an investment strategist or a CIO. Uh, I actually wanted to be a chef for most of my uh, youth. And I sort of trained in that direction. Um, and actually, I worked out in Italy as a, for a little bit as a commie chef, sort of uh, very lowly uh, uh, worker, sort of uh, chopping vegetables and being sworn out by the head chef. Uh, and it was there that I decided that um, actually I wanted to be sworn out in another industry. Um, and so I sort of wrote lots of letters uh, to various sort of chief executives of the finance industry. And one of them very kindly gave me two weeks work experience. Um, I sort of uh, trained as an analyst at that stage, so an equity analyst just covering um, the retail sector. And I kind of discovered that I was quite interested in this stuff. And, and over time, I had great mentors. So I was very lucky to come across uh, people who um, kind of inspired me, particularly um, uh, there was one particular guy who kind of suggested that I flip into looking more at the world from a, from a top-down perspective, looking at from sort of a macroeconomic perspective. And I did a master's in economic development um, on his urging. And, and I didn't really look back from that point. I discovered something that I was really, really interested in. It's tragic to say, uh, but development economics and economics you know, uh, and markets, um, just uh, I, I find um, endlessly interesting, endlessly challenging and a source uh, of, uh, uh, yeah, just uh, like I say, uh, a source of great interest all the time. So I'm very lucky in discovering um, a job that I, uh, I really, really enjoy and find, uh, and find no doubt extremely challenging at some times. Yeah, of course. And, and I think I'm right in saying you've recently been promoted as well. Um, is that right? Yeah, right? yeah so they very kindly, uh, the, the, the Barclays um, promoted me to Chief Investment Officer, uh, when was it? It was the end of uh, last year. So I've been in the, in the seat now just over a year. Um, uh, so I think it was in sort of December 2018 that they uh, uh, made me that. So it's been quite a year, <laughs> yeah, quite a year and a half. Yes, yeah. Imagine. And what, uh, what yeah. are the main sort of th things you cover in your, your role now? So um, I have a great team. Uh, I think that's the, the most important point. So uh, sort of I represent uh, a large group of kind of um, economists, asset allocators, fund selectors, uh, you know, portfolio construction experts, all those kind of things. Um, and so um, we are very blessed in that, in having that kind of scale. That's one of the advantages of working for a big organization. Uh, and my day to day is really um, quite a lot of it involved at the moment in sort of the tactical allocation side of things. So really looking at the shorter term opportunities. Um, 
uh, and making sure that people, uh, you know, A, that we're on the right track there, but also, you know, quite a lot of this job, as you know, is, is about communication and making sure that investors understand what you're doing and why you're doing it um, and uh, and just making people um, aware of, uh, you know, uh, of, um, of, uh, of the benefits of uh, outsourcing uh, some of your investment activities to a kind of large and competent team, which I, I personally believe yep. you're very lucky to have. And am I right? Am I right in saying um, that this is all related to s sort of um, investing your clients, sort of the strategy behind investing the clients' money in the retail side of the business? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's right. I mean, I, I think the big the big thing for for us has long been um, that Barclays has a huge presence in the retail space. Obviously, you know, not just the sponsorship of the, the Premiership, but also you know, huge retail branch network. And so we've always had a strong brand in that space. And what we have uh, internally is also um, a collection of very strongly performing multi-asset class, uh, you know, globally diversified investment products. Um, you know, which encompass you know your plain vanilla, the uh, passive implementation, also with bits of active implementation, and then thirdly, you know, you've got a uh, a sort of impact ESG um, sort of range as well. And so really it's about plugging uh, the two in together, you know, and trying to make sure that our uh, our, uh, our investors, our customers are, are using their savings as wisely as possible, that we're making the most uh, of those savings uh, for their future retirement plans, future uh, spending plans, and, and whatever other goals that they have uh, uh, in, their, uh, in their future state. Um and I thought a, a good place to start uh, our conversation was to just analyze the current state of affairs um, sort of globally. We're obviously experiencing one of the most unique moments in the history of uh, the stock market. Volatility has been, in, been a record highs for a prolonged period of time. And uh, we may potentially be in the midst of, a, of, of the quickest V-shaped recovery, at least in stocks, in some uh, markets on record. Have you ever experienced anything like this before, Will? In a word, no, Ed, no, I don't. I, I don't think there is an analog to this situation. To be honest, I mean, I think it's you know, it's probably closest to a kind of major natural uh, disaster. Um, you know, many economies are experiencing a recession that you know the statistics are just struggling to describe. They weren't designed to describe this kind of uh, uh, this kind of recession in truth. So look at the U.S. unemployment data. I mean, it, this is one of the sort of you know one of the stories at the moment. If you had a um, a chart to describe some of the sort of you know some of the extraordinary situation we're faced with economically it, it would be that um, unemployment claims in the US and you know if you look at the US unemployment data um, you know look back to 1929 for example as a sort of comparison um, and you know the post the great crash in 1929 it took 24 months I think uh, for the US to reach uh, a 14 percent unemployment rate this time they were there and likely well beyond in a matter of months so it really is you know a genuinely extraordinary situation um and, and i think quite difficult to compare to other historic episodes yeah yeah no, definitely and um as far as i've, I've been like w watching a lot of uh my, my, my sort of people on twitter and everything that this re recent rally is is apparently one of the most hated of all time for a lot of uh, especially in the retail side but there's also a lot of um, notable hedge funds though in, in net short positions currently uh, so there are some you know smart people uh, that are looking uh, or betting on a sort of decline from current levels is the, do you think the current rally is sustainable? In particular, the US indices seem to be one, the ones that have recovered strongest. Um, well, we, yeah, I mean, that's interesting, Adam. I, I, we actually did um, suspect that, um, that this rally was, um, was possible um, back in those kind of darker days in, uh, uh, in March and April um, and invested accordingly. And I think that the, the point about this, I think, is just thinking about the, the market mechanism. Uh, you know, prices reflect always um, a kind of an evolving assessment uh, of a range of probable um, you know future outcomes now what you find in kind of very new situations like we just described you know an unprecedented situation um, where you've got plunging markets people just don't know what the recession ahead looks like um, and, and people at that stage remember looking at you know looking at the terrible experience of, of Lombardy um, and the suffering that was going on there and at that stage markets were really imagining what could happen um, if what was the worst case scenario with Lombardy or what was what, what was that range of probabilities look like if Lombardy was the experience of the rest of the world now 
you know, and this is often the case when you find in sharp market downturns, that range of probabilities becomes much more skewed towards what we would call left tail risks, you know, the uh, kind of in this case, you know, a depression, bank runs, all the kind of economic, um, uh, you know, horrors that we, um, we don't, you know, we, we definitely don't want to experience. Um, now, as that left tail was kind of being uh, exaggerated or being given a larger than normal uh, role in that probability distribution, then you found that very quickly, uh, policymakers around the st world stepped in incredibly forcefully. Then we also found increasing evidence coming in that containment worked, um, that actually, you know, Western society was capable of um, adhering very, uh, you know, very tightly to um, government edict. Um, and, you know, it, it did work in sort of in suppressing the curve, uh, as people hoped. And we've also had a little bit of better news uh, in terms of treatment and even to the vaccines and so on uh, and so what you found is that that left tail risk um you know probability has been de-emphasized and that to us has been the main driver uh, between the market recovery now as we stand today i have to admit we're getting a little bit less um we're a bit more neutral on risk right now um our feeling is that sentiment has gone uh, quite a long way um, I'm not sure whether that argues for a sort of a huge down to a you know, huge slump in stocks. But what it does suggest, I think, to us is that there is a little bit less capacity for markets to absorb new bad news uh, than there was, say, you know, back in March, April time. OK, so potentially if there were some bad news came out, because it, it seems to be at the moment um, bad news did, isn't really bad for the markets, isn't it? Is it, it, it I can't remember the common phrase, um, uh, news, any, news only matters when it matters or something like that, along the lines of that. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Uh, obviously, we've been, uh, you know, unemployment rates are spiking in the US, the GDP uh, um, is getting uh, revised down, uh, but it all seems to be positive for some of the indices at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, that's... That that's an indication that just markets are forward-looking instruments, you know, and this is, yeah. it's such a difficult concept for people to get their heads around. But I always think, you know, that, you know, because you read something in the news and you think that's terrifying, I want to sell everything. Um, but actually, you know, most of the time, and if you look at sort of, you know, what you can look at, uh, you know, say you look at past recessions, and again, I, I like I said, you know, you don't want to use past recessions with reference to this one. It's very different. But if you look at the way markets react uh, to recessions in the past, you found that actually markets peak on average. If you're looking at US uh, classified MBER, National Bureau of Econ Economic Research uh, classified recessions, markets peak um, tend to peak on average about eight months before the recession starts uh, and are back to where they began um, eight months afterwards. So you can see that often the bottom in stocks can occur uh, before the really bad news even comes in. So it, yeah. it is a very difficult concept to get one's head around, I always think. And why, why do you think the dynamics around this, this um, decline has been so much different to before? What, what's made it, why has there been such a huge, huge volatility? And, and um, I mean, there's been a recovery basically as quick as the decline almost. Yeah, it's 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 just. Um, I mean, in a way, you know, it, it's a very difficult situation. We we didn't know how policymakers were going to react. Um, there were worries before that policymakers were going to be constrained um, going into the next recession. That was what you know most people were talking about. You know, policymakers being out of bullets and so on. You know, governments did have didn't have much room to spend money, and central banks had already cut interest rates. And, and those kind of narratives just, A, I think in this, this case, underestimated how quickly and forcefully policy, policymakers could act in the absence of moral hazard. And I think that's always a constraint um, in terms of policy action and going into uh, some crises, um, you know, because there is the need uh, to punish certain types of behaviours so that they don't get, or not, not reward certain types of uh, behaviours so that you don't get further problems down the pipeline. This time, it's no one's fault. Uh, you know, it's not Italy's fault that they suffered such a grievous economic and societal blow uh, from, uh, from, from the coronavirus. So in a sense, that's freed policymakers' hands to, to act, like I say, incredibly forcefully. Um, that's part of it. Um, but also, this is a total unknown. You know, this is always, you know, what you find with markets. It's, you know, it's, you sort of, um, you know, the, the, the initial reaction is, right, let's try and get the worst case scenario and try and see how bad it can happen. And then I can adjust my pricing as I get new information in. Uh, and that new information, uh, you know, like I say, markets are now looking at a sort of a, a slightly more balanced assessment um, 
of the future path from here, not only focusing on what could go wrong, and there's lots that could still go wrong, but also focusing on what could go right, you know, early vaccines, uh, you know, that kind of thing, and, uh, and sort of, you know, slightly better news on transmission and various other sort of factors associated with the virus. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's it, it is a very novel situation. I think the other thing to point out about this recession, I think it is, you know, this is a matter of some debate at the moment. I have no sort of you know, you know, too authoritative answer, but I, I sort of get the sense, or I, I get the rationale that the reason why this is definite, in a sense, is that if you look at the last you know great recession, um, you know, the great financial crisis, um, uh, you know, it took a decade for the sort of inequities. Um, or, or the um, uh, the sort of uh, uh, so the, for the build up and excess uh, within the subprime housing market to kind of you know to really manifest itself. Now, because of that, you know, you had this huge recession, and recessions usually come along. You know, you can think of recessions. Most recessions, like a particularly strict headmaster or headmistress, they come along to you know correct bad behaviour every now and again to get us back on the straight and narrow. And that's very much you know how you can think of the 07, 08, um, you know recession in many ways. And what that also meant was that you had a huge overhang to work through um, or work off in the recovery. So you had a much slower recovery, you know, uh, rec recessions where you impair the transmission mechanism, the banking to the financial sector, uh, that tends to be a much slower recovery. Now, this time it's different because what you are doing is policymakers have, it, there wasn't too much wrong with the global economy before this. Uh, it was, you know, its major actors were relatively healthy. So but policymakers have deliberately put large chunks of the economy to sleep to some kind of induced coma uh, in order to facilitate fighting the virus. Now, if policymakers' actions to keep those large parts of the economy you know, on life support are successful, then the recovery shape of recovery could look quite different uh, to how you would from a sort of, you know, a big financial crisis or other types of recessions. Yep. And it's, I just wanted to dig into this, um, this sort of government uh, reaction to the to the to the virus and you know the Fed buying program etc. Um, economies throughout Europe have, have, have done similar things. Um, there's this that common phrase that you shouldn't don't fight the Fed, um, which seems to be running true. Is what are the implications of of this sort of endless printing of, of money on a on a scale much higher than before? Um, how is, is that? What are the pro potential problems that could cause in the long term um, with debts so high for the for governments nowadays? Yeah, I mean, so there's a number of things. It's a really complicated uh, question. I mean, I, first of all, I would contest. I don't think that personally, they're not yet printing money in the way that you know the the sort of um, the caricature demands in a way. You know, they're still creating balance sheet. We haven't seen you know genuine helicopter money just yet. There's been talk of it in the press, but it, it's not it's not how I would sort of think about it in a way which is really genuinely coordinated. Um, you know, government and central bank activity. There's elements of coordination, but these aren't sort of, this is not sort of permanently increasing the money supply. Remember, in the modern economy, you and I are still the kind of, um, you know, the money printers. It's up to us to decide, uh, you know, when we borrow money and it's up to the banks to decide uh, whether to lend it to us. And that's when money is created. So central banks can create a lot of balance sheet, um, but in a way, at the moment, they're not kind of like all the way down to, uh, to, to money printing. But you're right. I mean, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, the first thing to point out is that, you know, in a way, the great financial crisis has been helpful here. You're not going to hear that very often, but in a way, it's given policymakers a very good, up to date, a freshly inked playbook on how to deal with these kind of, um, these kind of, you know, the sort of crisis that can happen in financial markets and therefore leak into Main Street. So you found the Fed, you know, really scanning the world for any signs of, um, you know, problems that it could, um, it could hit on the head. So, you know, things like, uh, you know, the repo lines where it was so proactive so quickly when it started seeing those, you know, the dollar funding costs going up for certain economies. Um, they've been so forceful and proactive. And, and that's the lesson from the last crisis is don't wait. Um, and that's the thing that the ECB has followed suit as well. So you found the central banks, uh, the speed of action has been incredibly impressive and very, very useful, in my opinion. Now, like you say, we are definitely storing up problems uh, for the future, in, and some of them will be sort of slightly un uh, unpredictable in nature. But you know, a lot of people are focused on the idea that the Fed is now buying um, not just uh, you know it's gone down to junk debt and included that in its palette of viable securities. Mm -hmm. There are some you know there's some real concerns about 
you know, again, moral hazard, you know, like how can I, you know, I gain the wins, but I socialize the losses, you know, it feels, you know, uncomfortable. We're in uncomfortable territory uh, for the future. But I think like the government spending uh, deal, uh, where you've seen a huge increase in government spending around the world, huge deficit spending from, you know, in some cases already quite high deficits. The, it, it's Those problems are tomorrow's problems. They really have to get you know, if we don't spend money now, if they're not as aggressive and forceful as they have been, then, you know, there are really, really seriously bleak scenarios as a result. You know, you, you find tomorrow is much more difficult to get to in some circumstances. So I think many policymakers will consider some of these kind of moral hazard problems as nice problems to have, uh, to be honest, and they'll, 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 they'll combat those further down the line. But you think about it, you know, Governments are going to have to own, so many governments around the, around the world are going to have to own, uh, subsidise, you know, large chunks of the economy. How are they going to sort of restore some form of, uh, you know, creative destruction? Businesses that should have gone bust, going bust. Yeah. You know, how are you going to make sure that your economy is making optimal use of the resources it's got? Um, you know, all of those kind of things are just, you know, they're tomorrow questions, but they're fascinating ones. Um, I'm just not sure how they'll be answered. But if we're saying that this is the new way for central banks to combat potential downturns to almost avoid any sort of pain mm. um is that if they keep on do if, if that's how they're gonna uh, react to the the next recession because that is inevitable we're gonna have another time in the future like this is is i mean is, is that just compounding on top of problems that are tomorrow's problems today or whatever yeah no it's, it's a great point ed and I, I would say though i think this one is different this time is different. It's always a dangerous thing to say, isn't it? But I think this one is different because of the absence of moral hazard. Um, you know, previously, in many other recessions, the way that you had to deal with them, in a sense, was to allow those businesses that haven't been, or those sectors of the market, or, you know, you, you do try and, whatever, to whatever extent is possible, um, you know, preserve some form of uh, of hazards, some you know, some jeopardy in a sense, because it's quite important to the functioning of the economy. But in this case, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because you can, you know, in a way, those businesses that were running sort of you know very tight working capital, some of the businesses that were being very effectively run are just being taken out by government edict in a sense, because the government is turning around and saying, in many countries, you know, you're not allowed to go out, you're not allowed to do anything, you're not allowed to spend this. So how do you, you know, in that sense, you know, you have to sustain. Yeah arguments about moral hazard and but i agree i mean so I, I but i don't think that this is necessarily um the complete playbook for how you fight every recession you know unfortunately okay. i think recessions play quite an important role uh, in our economy both in um you know in future productivity and um and just again that sort of that 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 slight jeopardy it's not a nice thing to say but it, it may be an important economic fact yeah no, that's true um and uh, on that note, so how long do you think the economy is um, going to be feeling the pain from shutdown? Central banks, et cetera, sort of expecting sharp turnaround in the third quarter. Do you, do you see that sort of running true? And I, I suppose that's sort of what the stock market's pricing in at the moment. Um, well, see, like unemployment levels returning relatively quickly to better levels. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is you know, the, the trillion dollar question. I mean, it's... it's um, yeah, I mean, there were, you know, we're all looking to Asia's experience, aren't we? And, and and that is one thing where we're getting a bit of a sort of a guide as to sort of what to expect. And, and they're not perfect. You know, there's no perfect comparison. These economies are very differently managed, organised. They've got different sectoral focuses, all those kind of things. But what you are finding is that, it, you know, it does seem to be quite easy to get the sort of the industrial economy back into activity. You know, order books have, um, have, uh, have jammed up a little bit. So you've got some sort of backlog of orders to work through and uh, perhaps some factories are easier to manage social distancing policies on. Um, it's the consumer side of the economy, which is slower. And in a sense, what, pe what many people in markets, I think, underestimate is that, you know, it's not so much about governments relaxing standards um, and governments telling you or, or authorities and policymakers telling you what you can do. It's what people feel like doing what they're comfortable or confident enough to do so you know in seoul you're still finding that for instance in, in south korea you're still finding that you know for instance uh, cinema outings are way down i mean you know totally uh, unrecognizable to trends of last year um things like uh, you know uh, use of public transport all those kind of things you know that is going to take a long time to return so there are parts of the economy that are just going to take a lot longer 
but other parts which you know you're going to find uh, you know a fairly rapid recovery um, in demand. The key you know the key sort of trade off, as you well know, I mean this is you know teaching grannies to suck eggs, is that um, it, it, it's you know trying to manage further outbreaks, and you need the capacity. Uh, to sort of not go down into, you know, you know, retreat into full lockdown. You know, the industrial economy has got to work out how to coexist um, with this virus, which is now endemic to the global population. And that's a global population which, you know, most estimates is way short of herd, herd, herd immunity. And it's a very transmissible uh, disease. Most people seem to agree that. Um, and so, in a sense, that's the, that's the key, uh, you know, the, the key thing to work out. And you're seeing it's complicated. It's very, it's a tight road walk. Uh, you know, Korea is experiencing, you know, recent the, you know, uh, the outbreak uh, in Seoul uh, associated with the kind of nightclub district. Um, and, and you've seen, I think, last I saw, there was about, you know, 150 uh, identified um, uh, people having caught the, caught, uh, the, the COVID-19. Um, but they tested, I mean, this was a stat from last week, but already they tested something like 35,000 people who had been to the nightclubs wow. or alone associated or living with uh, people in the nightclub. So you can see the effort it takes. Uh, to get back to even sort of you know a semblance of normality yep and what sort of impacts if we just um predict that maybe unemployment takes a little bit longer to recover what, what sort of impact does long-term unemployment have on on economies it's it's a, it's, a, it's a painful um yeah it's a, it's, a, it's one of the things that you know really is uh you know economists fear the longer people are out the workforce um the harder or the less relevant their skills tend to become. Um, there are technical terms to describe this, um, and it is one of the big fears at the moment, um, is how do I sort of minimise that um, um, hysteresis uh, effect? Um, and, yeah, there's no clear answers to this. I mean, the interesting thing is how differently the various economies are managing this. So if you look at the U.S., for example, and this is, you know, the U.S. labour market has long been a model of kind of flexibility. They manage the amount the U.S., the, you know, the Americans manage their economy very differently uh, to how we manage uh, our economies in Europe. You know, a lot of the time uh, you tend to find, you know, they prize uh, agility to a greater degree. So it's, it's easier to hire and make redundant, uh, make people redundant. Um, but that means that flexibility. So you tend to find that unemployment rises much quicker, but also comes down a lot quicker. Whereas in Europe, uh, what you're finding is that you know, you're like the UK scheme and a lot of Europe, uh, many governments are trying to, um, are paying companies to retain staff on. Now, how will that impact the shape of the recovery? To your point, it's a really important one, I think, um, is will, you know, will workers in um, America, for instance, because one of the big sort of concerns about the future from this is, you know, will consumers now want to save more of their post-tax earnings uh, for that now very vivid rainy day. Now, if you compare the two systems, will that reaction be greater in the US where they have experienced unemployment and all the kind of horrors that come with it? Or will it be, and, and, and will the European system fare a little bit better in a sense because they've managed to keep workers on, those workers probably maybe a little bit less scarred by the experience? It's just pure speculation, but it, it shows just how differently the ways of managing your economy um, could have you know far-reaching impacts in terms of things like your savings ratio um, and you know the point you allude to you know the fact that uh, people out of work for long periods of time um, you know struggle uh, struggle more to add to economic activity. Yep. And are there any sort of metrics you're looking at very closely to give an indication of what's happening in uh, the economies globally, sort of consumer spending and all this sort of thing? Are these the, the key? <laughs> Yeah, so all, I mean, all statistics are, you know, the statistics are in a way increasingly meaningless through this kind of, yes, um, this piece, because they're all just jaw dropping, aren't they? But they're, they're not telling you anything that you don't already necessarily know. Um, you know, so I mean, if you look at, you know, so a lot of people are focusing, you know, there's, there's all sorts of kind of high frequency indicators that people are now giving a little bit greater weight, uh, you know, so the geolocation location services, those kind of things. Um, that you know, provided by um, Apple and Google in terms of you know how many people are asking for directions and stuff like that. You know, so that kind of data is kind of giving you an idea of how quickly people are getting to some form of normality, um, and those things can provide a bit of colour. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of the economic statistics that we usually lean so heavily on, um, you know, particularly uh, you know the PMIs, the leading indicators, um, they are um, 
less relevant now. I mean, the irony, uh, an, old, uh, an old colleague of mine, an old boss of mine was pointing out, you know, that I've, at Barclays, I've, I've been encouraging my team to make sure that the sales force talks about very little else other than the PMIs in terms of data points for, you know, for our customers to look at to give them a lead indicator um, of what's coming in the economy. You know, don't want to focus too much on all the lagging data, focus on the PMIs. Uh, and when the PMIs finally did plunge, uh, the irony is we were all expecting it. So you can yeah. see like, wasted hours lecturing, hectoring poor, uh, uh, poor internal sales force on, uh, on this subject. And um, in terms of like the, the global economy, are there certain regions you think that are going to, um, continue this sort of recovery strongest and come out the side, other side sort of um, the best. Will, will America still reign supreme in the next sort of like 10 years or so? Obviously a hard one to predict again, but are there certain yeah. you're looking at? Well, so I, yeah, I, I don't, I have to admit, and I don't have strong views on this one at the moment. I think the really interesting thing is kind of, you know, because there's going to be, this is going to have, I think, far reaching consequences on how you organize your state. Um, you know, because you know, certainly in the early days, you know, a lot of the focus has been on, you know, the state capacity in places like Korea and Taiwan, who, you know, displayed so far at least, you know, an incredible degree of kind of technocratic um, competence. Now, you know, does, you know, do things like, you know, just to back to that point on labor markets, does that sort of change the way you want to organize how you hire and fire people or change the way you you know you build your social safety net does bigger government now become the norm is it the sort of you know this is the this is a death blow for uh, those of a sort of libertarian uh, frame of mind so there will be huge far-reaching consequences and, and what we are urging uh, clients at the moment is really not to stay you know get too focused um, on um, on country level winners and losers you know in the absence of kind of live sport people seem to have uh, kind of be indulging in some kind of coronavirus country level uh, derby, you know, who's doing better, who's doing worse. The fact is that all sorts of pre-existing factors and uh, other kind of noise are really skewing how this debate is um, currently appears at the moment. Uh, and we would be very wary of kind of post-mortems when we're this early um, on in the sort of in the fight against the, the coronavirus. There are some very interesting sort of, you know, obviously, what you're seeing from markets is that they've moved very quickly to do exactly as you say. So the US and the tech sector, the really the sort of stars so far, and, uh, and you know, the quality factor is another one, you know, uh, that really are the stars of the show so far. But will that remain the case? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I still would rather have a more diversified approach. I, I don't think that, um, uh, that putting, a, you know, I'm, I'm not more convinced than ever to put all my eggs in one basket, I have to admit. Okay. Um, but what, what sort of indications would you be looking for going forward to, to help guide your decision in that sort of area? If it's yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, again, what you're always doing with, uh, with this job is you're always looking at the incentives um, on offer from markets relative to um, the information you have and your kind of, um, you know, range of, uh, of um, expected, um, you know, your range of, your probability range. And I think... You know, one of the things that I would say is that um, if you look at sort of, you know, the, the quality factor or, you know, growth, for instance, and you look at the gap between um, that and um, the value factor, um, which is obviously, you know, right in the depths, incredibly unpopular. People are wondering whether value investing is dead. I, I would be tempted to lean a little bit in the other direction, to be honest, because like I say, I, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. That the winners of today are the winners um, are, are, are the winners of tomorrow, uh, and really, what we're keeping an eye on is the development of policy. So, one of the really interesting things that's happened at the moment, and we get back to that kind of um, the, the the debt story, and you know, some of the sort of debt accrued from fighting this crisis. And one of the reasons we're you know, a little bit less concerned, possibly, than some. I mean, there's two reasons. One, debt servicing is a lot easier with interest rates at these levels, uh, with real interest rates so low. You know, you can just borrow more. But two, it, you know. This crisis, because of the absence of moral hazard, has the potential to force some really interesting compromises. You know, the sort of Hamiltonian moment in Europe where you're seeing, um, you know, the growing potential for sort of mutually um, issued or mutually guaranteed debt. That could actually start removing uh, one of the genuine problem children um, in terms of, you know, debt piles. Uh, and that's Italy. So 
you know, like I say, I think this this crisis could change um, our view of who are the natural winners and losers um, very easily. And I think the danger that we always have and the weakness we have as decision makers, just as a species, is that, you know, we find it very difficult to imagine the future. Um, of course we do. Um, it's unknowable from our vantage point. But if you look at all the attempts to imagine the future, they're mostly just the line in kind of, you know, a straight line extrapolation from the recent past. That's almost never the way uh, that it goes. So I think we have to think a bit more creatively uh, about which sectors and markets uh, might be um, might be the eventual winners. But with low conviction, this has got to be a low conviction bet. You don't want to be turning around and saying, well, you know, just because I'm working from home now, everyone else is going to be feeling the same. And, uh, you know, therefore, uh, the online world is definitely going to grow. I want to bet the house on that. I can make equal cases for people saying, actually, I want to spend less time at home, less time with my family, and I want to work in the office much more. Uh, so, you know, just be wary of overconfidence. I think that's our core yep, advice. Yep. Um, and in terms of the recovery, if there was a, a two or three factors you'd be looking for that could potentially upset the current sort of state of affairs, what, what would you be sort of keeping an eye on? Uh, what's, you know? Yeah, it's the secondary outbreaks. I think those are the, ma those are the major things that people are, people are really worrying about is, you know, how, you know, because as you relax containment, we have to expect that the transmission of the, um, the virus will rise again. And particularly as we start getting into, um, you know, towards the end of the year. A vaccine is likely some way about way off. You know, even people talking about you know breakthroughs by the end of this year. Mass produced vaccine for the world um, is is is, is going to take a while. Um, so you know the secondary outbreaks are really key. And if we have to go back into full lockdown, that changes the calculation quite a bit. I think for the for the world and for asset markets uh, because that starts to do you know really much longer term damage. So really the key is that tightrope. Uh, that we're walking of sort of you know managing the uh, uh, you know the reproduction rate of the virus in all of these economies uh, and making sure that any out outbreaks are really managed in a way that does minimal damage um, to um, to your economy because it, in a way you know we have to be aware that this is um, uh, you know the health concerns it's not a sort of simple trade off between uh, you know health and the economy uh, you know with lost jobs and lost income. Uh, becomes incredible and and indeed containment becomes becomes for certain households you know incredible stress um, you know mental health issues all of those kind of other things so it's it's a it's a very 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 complicated um, uh, complicated policy maker question the other thing obviously which is cropping up more recently which is a bit of a concern is the you know trade tensions between China and the US that's yeah. not something uh, we'd want to uh, want to see more of to be honest. Um, so yeah, that, that, those are the two major things that we're keeping an eye on uh, very carefully. And um, I wanted to move on to now just a little bit more about the sort of strategy, investment strategy sort of side. Um, so obviously we're in, in a period of great uncertainty. We've just sort of been discussing this in a, in a little detail, but how, how do you sort of position your portfolio in times of great uncertainty uh, if you're looking to achieve at least, you know, some, some, some growth um, if that's your, your, your sort of target, is it better to change yeah. the cash? Like, is it when, when, you know, what sort of decisions do you make in this? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the key is, I guess, I guess is not, um, you know, the easy thing in these situations is to sort of be the market mop. So when everyone's terrified, you sell all your risk assets, and you know, when everyone's buoyant, um, you know, you um, you add, and that way you just, you know, you're, you're likely to get caught, you know, very badly caught out in many ways. I think, you know, the problem, um, you know, for many of us, I mean, the real problem, I guess, in terms of this is that the sharpness of this drawdown will reaffirm to many how little they want to be exposed to such drawdowns. Um, and therefore, you know, they'll want to protect more. Now, the problem is that these downturns are mostly unpredictable. Most recessions are unpredictable. And that's the point of them in a way. If they were predictable, then it wouldn't just be markets and investors standing out the way. Uh, it would be businesses and consumers, and they might not exist as a result. So uh, be wary of those who tell you that they can predict recessions or have predicted recessions. Most of them are just not predictable in the time. Uh, the, the factors can be, the factors that contribute to them, but the timing is always unpredictable. Now, in that case, what you have to accept, if you want a more protected portfolio or you want less drawdown risk, you have to take less risk. You have to give up some upside. And that is, unfortunately, the trade-off. Now, when you're acting in these crises, I think one of the useful tools that we've found is having a sentiment indicator that you've back-tested thoroughly 
Um, because what you tend to find is that, or what we have found is that, you know, doing the opposite um, at the extremes of sentiment. So when people are extremely gloomy, uh, as right backed up by your sentiment indicator, you tend to find that the ensuing six to 12 month returns are, are positive uh, and the reverse is also true. So often you find that just looking at sentiment and keeping laser focused on that um, can kind of declutter your in investment conversation a little bit um, because you're not going to have an edge in predicting where the economy is going to go or, uh, you know, yep. very, you know, government reaction functions necessarily. That's not really going to be where your core edge is. So just focus on where you think you've got an advantage uh, and stick to your uh, stick to your principles. I think. And how do you, uh, maybe it's proprietary software? Is it the the market sentiment? How do you sort of gauge that? Yeah, we've got an in-house uh, proprietary um, indicator. It's it's a mix of um, sort of market indicators. Um, and uh, and yeah, data. It, it's all from publicly available sources. I can uh, send it over uh, after this uh, after this podcast. But like all houses, we all have a different way of measuring it. The important point is that you're confident in that measure of sentiment. So you've got to back test it and make sure that you know relative to all sorts of different market regimes, that the extremes do actually give you a real signal. Um, yeah. There's real information in those extremes, and that 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 that's the key point. Um, there's all sorts of ways to construct um, sentiment indicators. Uh, some are available on, you know, all of the sort of uh, 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 on, uh, uh, you know, publicly. Um, some less so, but you know, the key, like I say, is to trust them internally so that you're confident that when you are acting at the streets. Because remember, the conversations you have, and certainly, I, I'm sure uh, anyone's no, no one's any different. The conversations you have at the market extremes, you know, the conversations we had in our asset allocation forum at the market extremes are extremely uh difficult you know people are very emotional it's you know markets are falling people are losing lots of money uh making the right decision in those moments is incredibly difficult uh, and it takes uh discipline focus um and an element of dispassion to be honest you know you've really got to try and stick to your principles uh, and that's why you want your principles stress tested before you go into the crisis rather than when you're in the crisis yeah yeah of course and but would you say then um if people didn't react emotionally to downturns, the best strategy is potentially just to ride it out or an ad if you had any spare cash during periods of decline or yeah, so sometimes that's the case. I mean, I think most of the most of the time, you know, what you're looking at is, you know, so if you look at market, you know, recession reactions and look at, you know, big stock price moves, what drives stocks in the first place? You know, it's two factors really. I mean, you know, well, overall, you know, academia says that, you know, a share price should be um, you know, a, a should move as a function of our assessment of all of the you know future cash flows discounted back to a present value. So that allows you to sort of split it into two parts: one, you know, the expected future cash flows, and two, our uh, our understanding or our assessment of how risky the business of accessing those cash flows actually is. So your kind of discount rate. Now, in a recession, both of those move sharply lower. So both your, you know, long so your expectations of all the future cash and your sort of, you know, your assessment of the riskiness um, of those cash flows. Now, what you often find is that that, you know, both of those elements can be quite transitory. So it can give you, um, it can give you, you know, because sometimes you overestimate the cost uh, in cash flows uh, of, of recessions. Um, and certainly in this case, you know, if it's a short, sharp one, then it, it, in a company's overall cash flow profile, it may not be that big a deal. But also that discount rate can move, um, you know, too far as well. So, you know, quite a lot of the time, these recessions, you know, do or these these moments can provide opportunities um, to um, to deploy your investments. Again, though, you know, remember the, the way we do tactical asset allocation, for instance, you know, so the overwhelming majority of returns is a function of the SAA, um, the strategic asset allocation. Now, that is you know, an exercise in investing humility. We mathematically imagine hundreds of thousands of different viable futures uh, and try and find the all-weather mix of assets that sits happily in the, in the middle of those. Now, that I would deploy on every single day. My only question I need to answer for that is do I think humankind is going to continue to be more productive, to invent new stuff and get better at using that new stuff? Because that's the driving force of portfolio returns, you know, the SAA, stock market returns, all that kind of stuff. The tactical allocation you know, is, is tiny at the margin. You know, it's, it's a small activity at the edge because I could never muster the confidence in those kinds of calls 
to make it much bigger than that. So it's an at the edge portfolio. So I would never recommend sort of saying to someone, you know, okay, I've got loads of cash sitting on the sidelines. I don't have any other investments. I'm just going to deploy it all now, you know, you know, because I see markets down. In a sense, don't wait for pullbacks. That money should always be in the market. But the tweaking at the edge, that is about like that sort of that lower confidence activity that can provide you opportunities at times when markets really fall uh, sharply. Sorry, long, complicated, waffly answer. But no, no, so, I was just going to say, <clears throat> so the, the strategic allocation, um, is that is sort of time frame more opportunistic? What sort of time frame are you looking at? So that's more five to 10 years, basically. Okay. Um, you know, in a sense, you know, if you think about your strategic asset allocation, it's really, um, it, it's about, it's not about, um, you know, it, it's really about making sure that you have uh, sufficient diversification. Um, so that whatever happens in markets, that you're not going to sort of, you know, that, that you're going to be as sort of um, have a smoother path through those, uh, you know, this inevitable turbulence as possible. Um, and it's really about making sure that you've got enough skin in the game. Um, so with stock markets and so on, but a degree of protection. So our medium risk portfolios, you know, they tend to have an equity beta. Uh, they correspond to equity markets, you know, about of 0.6, 0.7. Um, so you can see that you know stocks are going to be the dominant force in that um, uh, in that uh, in that mix. Um, but you know you do find we do use other diversifying assets, so alternative trading strategies, uh, you know emerging market debt, government debt, you know investment grade debt, high yield debt, um, you know sort of that provide varying degrees um, of uh, diversification from that primary driver of returns, which is always going to be stock markets. And um and at that part of the portfolio, are you looking to for, um, to be index-based returns, or are you looking to um, match them? What sort of what's the the sort of strategy? So, front? so the point about the SAA, in a way, is about getting the market. Because you know, if you think about as a, as an investor, you've got a couple of things. So first of all, you know, what I want to do is, you know, I take that positive decision. I don't know what the future holds. No one does. Um, but what I do, or what I have a hunch about, is that I think the future will be better. Uh, you know that humankind's condition will be better in 10, 20, 30 years time uh, than it is today. And, uh, and it's not knowable, that, that idea, but it, you know, a careful study of history tells you that that's probably the right answer. Um, so, you know, like I say, that's my sort of, um, that's my first decision. Now, in that, I want to get that market return as effectively as possible. Whatever the markets are going to deliver, I want to be able to do it in diversified fashion. So if you think I'm really trying to get kind of global GDP, um, because that's the rough opportunity set for the world's corporate sector. And then on top of that, I've got a couple of other kind of active decisions to make within it. So, you know, I can do a bit of TAA. So, you know, a little package of positions that sit on top of the SAA uh, to try and add to performance. Not, not, not every year, but as reliably as possible over time. Then I can, you know, within within multi-asset class world, which I work in, you can you can think about areas where I want to do, you know, stock selection. Now, with us, you know, we actually outsource stock selection. We don't have, or, or at least a lot of it, we don't have major stock selection resources internally. So we feel uh, strongly that, you know, what we want to do is select managers in particular spots where we think they can add value for us. Um, and so that is where you're trying to kind of, you know, with both the TAA and the manager selection piece, that stock selection piece, that's where you're trying to beat the benchmark, so, uh, uh, so to speak. The SAA is about getting that return in the first place as effectively, efficiently, um, and smoothly as possible. And um, maybe in the tactical allocation piece, um, what's your approach to diversification there within like stock specifically? How do you approach? Is that something you look to get? Yes, yeah, so, I mean we wouldn't we wouldn't use uh, stock selection within the TAA, uh, not from not okay. in our house anyway. Some people, some 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 houses do. We we use uh, so we would use ETFs in that space mm -hmm. um, most of the time um, because that allows us to just trade more easily. And in a sense, the TAA is not necessarily about pro providing insulation. It's literally just a constantly assessing the various. Um, incentives on offer within markets and seeing whether there are any mismatches in a sense so is the incentive in stocks in the short you know in the six month term uh, has it gone too low um, therefore do we want to use our you know risk budget in other areas um, that is a you know you know or has uh, you know is there any point in having you know tactical exposure to government bonds uh, you know is the investment grade piece which now enjoys significant policy support is that too um, 
uh, 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 too, too, um, uh, too cheap. Um, so those kinds of sort of questions are the ones that drive your your tax class allocation. In a way, it's just a package of positions, almost a black box, um, that you sort of hope that your process in terms of how you approach those incentives uh, adds return over time. And, and happily, I can say that we've you know, we've got a very good track record in TAA actually over a mm-hmm. decade now. So we we've, we've stuck to our processes, and uh, that's generally um, that's generally been more right than wrong over time, which is really what we're aiming for. Try, trying to uh, add a bit of a sort of performance cherry uh, on top of that SAA cake. Uh, for our clients as persistently as possible. Sure. And so, am I right in saying you don't you don't go as um, sort of micro as looking at specific sort of uh, themes that might be growth areas for the future, such as cybersecurity, five G, etc. Is it sort of more top level? Well, than keep that? an eye on this stuff. I mean, the, the concern I always have with thematic investing, and it's not 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 universal this, but the concern I have is that the more attractive the slogan. Uh, or the more intuitive the um, the idea, the more likely it is that everyone's already there. Um, you know, so we, you know, you, uh, because we know the way that these things work is that often, you know, something that I really, you know, when someone does the pitch to me, and I sort of think, oh, that just sounds absolutely logical, totally, uh, you know, so cybersecurity, for instance, uh, and what a lot of places do is they package up, uh, you know, baskets of securities yeah. um, and allow investors to access those, and those can be a good idea. You know, that, that that's that's a good, you know, can be a good way to for, for certain investors to access markets. Uh, for us, uh, that that does. Uh, it's not quite the way we think about markets, but we do keep an eye on those. Um, we do keep an eye on those trends just to see, um, you know, some of the things that people are thinking on this. But I, I, I wouldn't want to exaggerate um, our ability to to know the future or to see the future with any great confidence. Uh, you know what this crisis t- teaches us, I think, in many ways, is that that future. You know, the greater the confidence we hear someone predict the future, the less we should trust them. There was no one at the beginning of the year predicting this outbreak, uh, you know, predicting where we would be uh, in six months' time. Of course, there wasn't. There couldn't be. Um, but that is a reminder that, uh, you know, that confidence in the future. The one thing I feel comfortable saying um, is that humankind's lot will get better over time, more likely than not. Um, but that's about as far as I'm willing to go, to be honest. It's a bit yep. boring, a bit safe, but yeah. Yeah, yeah fair enough. And um uh, it's slightly related to that, but not, I suppose, slightly um, more macro level. Impact investing, is that something you look at? It's been suddenly growing in popularity recently. Um, yeah, very much so. I mean, oh, this is an area we're really interested in. So we were one of the early movers here. So we do have a multi-asset class um, impact fund, um, which has been doing uh, doing well and, and, and gaining in popularity, which is great. And one of the great things here, I think, about this trend is that, you know, previously when you wanted to... Um, express certain societal objectives or uh, ethical um, objectives uh, within your investing world. You know, most of your options involved um, uh, negative screening. You know, actually not owning stuff. Uh, you know, so I wouldn't own tobacco stocks or weapons companies or so on. Which is fine. You know, it's, it's certainly one way to go about it. But now you're getting more options because now you know the, the growth of impact is increasingly giving investors the ability to target positively specific societal environmental um, objectives and profit from them um, which hopefully I, I really hope is a, a game changer both for uh, investors and indeed the objectives they're trying to pursue so it, it's a great um, advent in the industry um, I can only hope that it gets sort of you know more airtime more growth uh, that we get more investing options um, because I, I think it's um, you know it's, it's one of the potential solutions uh, to some of the um, um, some of the problems that we face as a uh, as a as a species. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, ho- hopefully a snowball over time. It seems to be going very quickly. It's uh, very topical at the moment. Yeah, um, certainly. Does. Hopefully, it goes through that sort of. Uh, hopefully, it's not just a trendy topic and actually, you know, last last longer. But I mean, a lot of people I've been talking to are really interested in it. So it does seem like people are um, truthfully believe in it, and and that's what you sort of need and the emotional connection. I think, and I think it will. Go forward and yeah, I hope so. And one of the interesting things they found previously was that actually, um, you know, your the, um, the the there's been a lot of um, uh, talk so far in some of the Anglo-Saxon economies, but less action than one might expect. And actually, some of the economies where um, where the Green Party 
political party um, is uh, a much share, larger share of the vote. You've actually found that um, you know impact like investments are much more popular. So in a sense, you know the the, the, the rationale has been was that you know where people were willing to vote with their feet. Um, were, being, were willing to actually vote for you know, their environmental issues. Uh, they were also willing to invest. And actually in the economies where they were less willing to do so, they were more happy to talk about it rather than actually do anything about it. But I think that is starting to change. Um, and that's certainly something that we welcome. Yeah, but of course. And um, we touched on your, your sentiment indicator earlier. I just made a note. Um, are you able to share what sort of level that's at at the moment? Or is that sort of an internal... No, no, it's quite, it's quite high at the moment. I'm not going to lie, uh, and that was the point um, uh, that we um, we've been uh, looking at um, a bit of uh, risk, a bit of risk reduction because, uh, in a way, um, what that does show is that not that markets are due a huge correction or anything, but it, it shows that there is less less scope. Uh, for markets at these levels to absorb new bad news yes. uh, we just don't know where that bad news uh, could come from there could be more good news you know certainly you know treatment stuff and you know more vaccine data coming in you know over the next couple of months those could all be positives but equally we have to sort of concede that there are also you know scenarios where you know the news is less good the news flow is less good in the next uh, few months and so that does sort of color the way that you you know you should approach stocks in the very short run i think I just wanted to finish um, the, the podcast with a, a quick fire round. It's basically a few a few questions that are not meant to be uh, um, needing like long answers. Uh, just to roll through, there's, there's seven of them. <laughs> That's right. Sorry, Ed, yeah. <laughs> um, for the average investor uh, who has a full time job, what is, in your opinion, is a good strategy to try and uh, achieve above index returns? If there was just one thing they should stick to, I think. The real key here is to kind of focus. Is really um, focus your energies on a small part of the market. I think the more spread you are, the less less of an advantage you might have. You know, you don't have to get all of your if you if you are just picking stocks yourself. I don't think you have to get all of your exposure through picking stocks. Remember, you know, passive instruments are very useful in getting you market exposure in areas where you don't feel you have a strong. Um, a strong a strong suit so focus on where might be your advantages and really try and uh, gain some informational edge that's 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 really the key i think over the over the long term in terms of beating um sectors and, and be honest with yourself in terms of how you benchmark your activities um try and sort of make sure that you are comparing yourself uh you know to a passive alternative so that you can see if you are uh, you know genuinely skillful and genuinely um, you know adding value for yourself and when, when you mention passive instruments, uh, you're talking about ETFs, et cetera. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Um, top three mistakes you think investors typically make? Uh, so overconfidence is one. I think we, te we tend to overestimate our ability, um, uh, our abilities and specialist knowledge um, and, and the value of our specialist knowledge. Um, I think we underrate market efficiency. I think that's really, really important. So that does, if we if we don't have um, a sufficient understanding of how efficient markets are, that does likely relegate us to being a market mop over time, i.e. just mopping up the returns that nobody else wants. Um, and, and I think the other thing that I really sort of come across as investors a lot is the idea that I need to be active everywhere, um, that I need to have a view on everything. I think that's unnecessary. I think the beauty, and as I said in the, the first one, is that the beauty of the modern world in terms of investment is actually getting that overall market access, uh, the market exposure, diversified market exposure is so much cheaper than it's ever been. Your net return from that uh, you know that um, that market access is is more attractive than it's ever been, thanks to a few kind of pioneers in the industry. Um, and so, you know, don't you don't need to have bets everywhere. You can focus on particular corners or particular areas where you think there might be, uh, you know, some excess returns to yield, and really focus your uh, your energies and your uh, you know no doubt gigantic intellect on those particular uh, parts of the market. I think that is more likely to uh, to reap rewards start rather than sort of spreading your skill uh, thinly. Uh, around the world because remember you're competing against large teams of analysts who know these companies inside out uh, you know they, they they live in the chief executive's dustbin they know when uh, you know they you know, it, it's very hard you know you've got to have a high threshold uh, to be able to sort of uh, to, to beat these guys I think and that's you know you've got to have a respect for the competition I think that's the thing and that, that means you don't have to be active everywhere uh, but just try and make sure that you're uh, you know you're focusing your energies in the right areas of course and um, top tip for your younger self? 
Oh, this is so difficult, isn't it? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, because <laughs> both your mistakes and successes, I think, make you, um, I probably, uh, yeah, to try and try to, I, I'd, have, I'd have tried, and this is a tragic thing to say, but I'd have done slightly more uh, economics and maths focused uh, kind of A-levels rather than okay. really focus on uh, the arts and, and cooking. Uh, didn't necessarily prepare me for the career that I would ultimately have. So maybe I would have tried to, but I wouldn't have listened anyway. So there's no point in even, <laughs> even speculating. <laughs> I'm just like my youngest son, unfortunately, who uh, yeah, won't listen to a word. Uh, if Darth Vader had told me, maybe, maybe, I, would have been, maybe I would have listened, yeah. but not sadly. <laughs> um, is dollar cost averaging a strategy you recommend or don't don't uh, think is a, is a good one to abide by? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So we did a big study on this a while back, and we found that actually, you know, actually averaging in resulted in a more volatile end um, portfolio outcome. But and there is a button, it's an important button. So in a way, like the best strategy from just a pure volatility perspective is just to dump it all in a day one um, okay. and just not look. But there is a behavioral element here and, and it's whatever works for you because our message to our clients all the time is really, look, you know, it's about satisfying, making sure you're exposed to the market. There is no perfect time to get in. Um, you know, it's only ex post that we can think of that per perfect time. The reality is that the longer you are in the market, the more likely you are to yield, to, 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 to harvest uh, those excess returns um, that stocks in general and other asset classes tend to provide. So it's just about time in the market, the maximum amount possible. But if it takes um, averaging in as, you know, to get you into the market, if that's the way you feel most comfortable doing it, do it that way. That is much better than just not doing it at all and waiting for that perfect moment and dumping all of your assets in. So, you know, that's the way that we would approach it. And uh, a quick one related to your your younger self. Favourite meal? Have you got a favourite meal? Uh, I think it would be it would be something on the barbecue, probably. But actually, I'll go safe and just say risotto in case my wife listens to this. <laughs> And uh, finally, who, have you got an investing hero? Uh, not much, not so much actually. It's a bit. <laughs> it's a bit. Uh, I do. I do like um, how the guys at AQR think about markets and risk premium and stuff like that. I, I do think that they've got the right kind of angle. So I do prefer the more academic approach, just personally, uh, in terms of thinking about markets. And they have a sort of. Uh, they, they think about market efficiency in the same way as I do. But one of the interesting things I think that's been exposed in the last few years, thanks to, um, you know, cuter benchmarks and better understanding of risk, uh, you know, uh, of risk premium, like uh, associated with things like the value factor or the growth factor, is that quite a lot of the investing heroes we thought were doing an amazing job were really actually just kind of surfing risk premium. Uh, and actually there was no real... Um, there was no real uh, sort of skill in a sense uh, in what they did. We could have got their exposures passively if we had the same instruments as okay. we do today. So I would, um, uh, yeah, quite a lot of my heroes have been popped uh, over the last uh, few years. That base. Okay. Yeah, humility is the most important thing in any investor, to be honest. So okay. anyone who just pays that, I think, is, uh, is, is worth their salt. Well, thanks very much, Will. This has been a um really interesting conversation actually and um, it's obviously a very interesting time to be talking about it as well so thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk to you um, it's a pleasure lovely to speak to you too thank you and is a i think i believe um the main place that people could follow your sort of uh, musings on the market if you will um is on linkedin is that it can follow your your posts yeah, that's correct. So we do, we do, uh, yeah, LinkedIn's the best place. So we do publish, I publish all the team stuff through my feed, actually. So I sort of try and take credit for all of their hard work generally. And we do a weekly podcast, which you can access oh, on yeah. Spotify, SoundCloud, and uh, Apple Podcasts. It's called Word on the Street. Um, oh, so yes, it's, uh, it's, um, I hope well worth a listen. That's where we get sort of, you know, a lot of the experts in house, fund managers, asset allocators, um, and political experts. And, and we, you know, weekly, sometimes more than that, um, talk about everything we think. So, yeah, please do join. Excellent. Yeah. No, so, yeah, that sounds really good. I recommend um, the listeners go and have a, have a listen to that one as well. Um, great. Thanks, Will. Pleasure, Ed. Cheers. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, 
this might be of interest to you. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new podcasts, stock reports, or events from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. Until next time.